I I think we need to do a lot of thinking and rethinking and re-looking, addressing the problem from a different perspective, in my view. And how did I suddenly become so wise and why didn't I do it when I was at headquarters? Because since I left NASA, which is 16 years ago, I had time to think, which I didn't have when I worked there. And I have the time to think continuously and re-address and re-question. The IRAD is useful. It was a, a device in the, in the right direction, a resistive exercise. Obviously, it was going to be better. But we never really sat down and said, well, what is it that gravity does? How is it perceived? What is the signal? the body sees what is what is it you need to replace that you're taking away it's not necessarily uh in my view uh rotating spacecraft uh star trek device it's not necessarily that you you can get away i think with some other form of providing uh the stimulation that is the signal Exactly. Once you understand what the body needs as a signal. And in my view, what the body needs as a signal is a low intensity, high frequency, intermittent exposure to something akin to the gravity stimulus. You cannot train one muscle or part of the body of different aspects of the body with exercise, and you certainly can't do it once a day. Because if if you uh, did a time course of the changes that that occur during space flight, and then you did a time course immediately after exercise, you would probably find exactly the same pattern. In other words, the minute you stop exercising, you revert to microgravity. That is not true on Earth. Exercise on Earth is different because the minute you stop, you're still in gravity. Steve Hawley, uh, who was an astronaut and... and, uh, He was the deputy up at Ames. He was my colleague there at the Astronaut Corps, right? Right, exactly. And a very uh, sound thinker. Said to me something very interesting one day. He said, you know, John... I exercised as hard as I possibly could. The minute I stopped, I felt nothing. I said, what do you mean you felt nothing? He said, well, I was not out of breath. My heart rate was right down. And that made me think that we really should map what happens right after exercise. And I had told him then, which is over 20 years ago, and... To this day, I don't think everyone has looked at the after effect, the after response of exercise. I mean, we know what it is like on Earth, but that's not necessarily what happens in space. In space, you're right back to microgravity the instant you stop. So on Earth, we now know that it is, we are perpetual motion machines. We need gravity stimulation. We need to use gravity not just once a day. We know that exercise once a day does not counteract the effects of sitting, for instance. So why should it work in space? You have to have a way of providing the stimulus intermittently all day. And... If presumably when you sleep in space, it's anywhere near like sleeping on Earth, which it's not either, but it's closer, then at least 16 hours a day, you have to have the possibility of getting your your stimulus uh, intermittently. Now, how long the effect lasts, again, you have to figure out the instant you stop what happens so that you know what the interval is. Now, on the ground, for instance, um, and that was the last piece of research I ever did at Ames, it takes about 20 to 30 minutes 
after you stop exercising for many parameters to come back to normal. That doesn't mean that others don't continue. And I naively thought if you stand up, for instance, every 30 minutes, then that might prevent the effects of lying in bed 24 hours continuously. And sure enough, at least on the cardiovascular system, that was better. Just standing up, not standing up and exercising. Standing up was better than walking, Hmm. which was a big surprise to my statistician who told me, and then, of course, I couldn't believe it. That's counterintuitive from what we know. Well, currently in space, you know, we have a treadmill, we have an exercise bike, and there's this resistive exercise device, the A-RED, which astronauts can use to, su- to substitute for weightlifting, if you will. They load up their skeletons that way with this mm-hmm. resistive device. So you're saying that there's got to be some other element added to their daily exercise regimen on those machines if we expect them to get to be uh, fit and healthy uh, when they arrive at Mars then. Yes. Mm-hmm. Do you know what that is? <laughs> that's, that's a $64 million question. Right? Well, my bias is that, that uh, an, an artificial gravity device that, that, they, they, that they can get on and off easily many times a day. And there is no such design that I know in the works. And I insist on the having being user-friendly Perhaps even more than one astronaut at the same time can can jump on and off and not get a lot of, they don't need half an hour or an hour. They need to get the stimulus. So it can be every 10 minutes, it can be every half hour. It depends. It has to be figured out how often. But uh, if for on Earth, you, you have to do it every 20 or 30 minutes to maintain uh, normal health, uh, with in the presence of gravity, I don't know what it is in space. It it may be more often. It may be not. It can alternate with other ways of loading, like the kind of of, of uh, bands and so on that that the Scott Parashinsky took up with him. Uh, that kind of resi- but that only stimulates certain muscles, and we have to appreciate that. There's nothing wrong with that. It's the big muscles you want to maintain. Um, but all of the body needs to be stimulated, and especially the inner ear. I'm, I never thought I'd, I'd live to say this when in the first, <laughs> because there was such an emphasis on the vestibular system in NASA in the early days, and always has been. But the vestibular system is, is ending up being far more important than merely balance and coordination. I'm not underrating balance and coordination. I think you want it and you need it. But it is, it is the clearinghouse for blood pressure regulation. It is the clearinghouse for uh, a whole lot of activities, for muscle, for bone. Now there's, there's research on bone uh, being mediated through the vestibular system. So when the vestibular system goes silent, literally silent, uh, you're in trouble. And you've got to find some way of stimulating. Now, in my wildest dreams, I figure that it, once we learn what the frequency is, is required to maintain a viable vestibular system, you might be able to implant some sort of little stimulating device straight to give you your cues straight into the vestibular system. It should not be that hard. And it should not be that hard to find out, but it needs some really systematic research to find out exactly what the body sees on Earth with gravity and what it needs to maintain a functional vestibular system because you've got none up there. We ha- I saw um, Rick Searfoss uh, return from his, one of his first flights, nine days in space. And he was being tested on posturography on the balance platform. Eyes open, eyes shut, and we're all watching around, uh, chatting, you know, as we shouldn't have been. Uh, and at some point, I'm, I see him beginning to lean forward and then more forward 
and move forward. And I thought, oh my goodness, he's going to fl fall flat on his face. And I rushed to grab him, which is, of course is ridiculous because he's a big guy and there's no way I could have stopped him. And then others realized what was happening. We all grabbed him. And he shook himself and said, what happened? And uh, I said, you know, you are about to fall flat on your face. He said, I never, I, I never had any sensation of falling. This was nine days after being in space. He had lost the sensation of falling, never put reflexly put his arms out to protect his fall. And of course, as you well know, from then on, we've had a harness uh, while you do that test. The maps, the maps that are etched in the brain when you develop as a child to tell you where you are relative to the environment disappear. And yes, they come back. And yes, we need to reinforce, what we learn on Earth is that we need to reinforce them throughout life. Yeah, it took a good three days for my coordination and balance, balance yeah. to come back after Shh. my short Well, trips. that's pretty good. That's pretty good. But it does come back. This is the beauty. Yeah, you wouldn't want it to have driven with me those first three days, that's for sure. <laughs> no, <laughs> but then, you know, you wonder how long it would take Scott Kelly. Yeah. So... I know people have talked about creating artificial gravity environments, and it sounds like, um, especially for some of these long-duration missions, you think that there's potentially a way that we can avoid having to create the the spinning spaceship, as you talked about, like on Star Trek. Um, so do you think that we can absolutely find a way to kind of stay away from creating that artificial gravity environment? I'm convinced. Okay. I'm convinced. Uh, my human-powered uh, centrifuge uh, was an attempt at that. Very simple, extremely simple. All the other versions you see now, hugely complicated, mm -hmm. aversive to using it. Uh, mine was just a plate flush with the, with the uh, shuttle floor uh, with just a little mound for the motor in the middle, and you could hop on and off. And, and the important thing that came from the research is that you didn't need Exercise in G, yes, that was good, but you needed passive G, like as in changing posture. So you needed to be able to mimic not only the cardiovascular, but also the pull of gravity, the weighting, uh, just for just for a few, a, few, a minute, two yeah. minutes. So like standing up out of bed yes. with the bed rest, that, yes. that you talked about. Yeah. 